Steve's at the age where he doesn't care about going to a ball game with his dad. All he's interested in is girls. He doesn't want ball games. He just wants to ball dames. You know, I wonder who's the biggest freak, Steve or Joseph Gribble or Tina Belcher, because I don't use gender as a factor when it comes to this. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about American Dead, or more specifically, Steve Smith, and to a lesser extent, his father, Stan. Now, in many shows, especially in the early 2000s, there was an archetype of a boy who has a huge crush on a girl. They constantly get rejected, usually because they're a boring, nerdy loser, whose parents are income-wise, lower middle class to poverty level, while jokes on her because at least the loser boy will get into Harvard on a need-based scholarship and graduate with little to no debt. Granted, I don't think this is totally exclusive to the 2000s. Rick and Morty, which is the 2010s, has Jessica. Anyway, this is one of those things where it's fun in a cartoon, but in real life, it's kind of freaky. And yes, I know what I'm talking about. I've experienced it several times before. It's not typically a big deal in animation, unless they want to do a deconstruction or something like that. But how does this relate to American Dead? Well, with American Dead, a common plot point is that Steve can not only get a girl to not date him long term, but not do him. Or he will be about to do either or and then find a way to screw it up. The official reason is Steve is a loser or he tries too hard. But I disagree. I think the real reason Steve cannot date a girl is because he's just like his father on top of already having bad luck and or trying too hard. So let's discuss. I know this seems far-fetched but really think about it. Steve and Stan are kind of similar. As a child, Stan Stan was a loser, much like Steve, and nothing he ever did improved his situation until he had experimental treatments, which caused baldness, and then he got to the CIA, and the rest is history. Listen, son, I'm gonna show you something I've never shown anyone before. That's me when I was your age. Oh my god, you were hideous! Well, it certainly wasn't the stallion I am today. It's part of why he's so serious about how he's perceived by others, and why he tries to enforce this mindset onto his family, logic be damned. In a way, Steve is kinda similar. I don't think he's unattractive, but he also doesn't seem all that attractive. Do not take my words out of context, I'm just stating facts. However, Steve is also, and I hate to say this, he's kind of a creep and a weirdo. What the hell is he doing here? He doesn't belong here. Kitty, why do you always make that joke? Well, Catherine, why do people always pick it for karaoke? Hmm. Answer that question. For many people, when it comes to choosing an SO, personality goes hand in hand with attraction. And in some cases, it can outweigh the idea of appearance. Steve looks like a plain Jane, which wouldn't be a big deal to most people. But he's a creep, so to girls, popular or unpopular, that's a major turnoff. Don't get me wrong, Stan can be a creep as well. But for him, it just works. Either the people in his environment don't mind his behavior, or they think just like him, as we saw in Flirting with Disaster, where the workplace mindset is that flirting and inappropriate touching is okay. <laughs> yeah, I flirt at work. We all do. It's, it's nice to feel desirable, you know? It's harmless fun. Like eating grapes at the supermarket. But wait, let's get back to Steve and really think about it. In the pilot episode, Stan tries to set Steve up with a girl on lacrosse. Nice venture, a lot of my friends did that. But Steve rejects his father's offer and tries to go after a cheerleader named Lisa Silver. I have decided to go for the brass ring. Today, I'm asking out Lisa Silver, head cheerleader and future Mrs. Steve Smith. <laughs> Which in high school sitcom terms means the queen bee. Aw, oh, I wish I was a cheerleader. I had the boobs for it, but not the rhythm, or the discipline, or the time management. At lunch, Steve goes after Lisa, and he gets rejected hard. It's okay, baby. I can handle this. Yeah, baby. How could she just reject me like... Like I was a nobody. Wow, what a B word, right? Well, let's look at Steve's moves. See how Steve tries to get Lisa's attention, almost like how Stan would get the attention of, say, Francine or a female co worker? Ow! Hi, Lisa. Did that hurt so good? 
It's Steve. Yeah, if a kid did that to me, I would smack him so hard. You don't touch me. But let's relate this back to Stan. To Stan's co-workers, there's the general knowledge that it's just good fun, and nobody means anything by it. If any of them said they were uncomfortable, everybody else would probably listen. To Lisa Silver, who doesn't know Steve personally, he's a creep. Plain and simple. While he does later get with Lisa, she makes the point she's only with him for the power of him being president. She even says, Steve, I like the perks of dating the school president, but I'm not gonna kiss you. I mean, I'm beautiful, and you're repulsive. But I thought you liked me. Oof, sorry, Steve. However, this behavior is not limited to the pilot. Early on, one of Steve's major personality traits was that he was a creep. Like when he couldn't get with any girl and Stan knows best because of this behavior. Girls want to get down just as bad as we do. Here, here, watch. Hey, Foxy. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I think a simple hello would have sufficed. But why is Steve such a creep? Well, part of me wouldn't be surprised if this was something Stan taught him. To a macho man like him, girls want to be chased, and if they say no, it's not because they aren't interested or already taken, it's simply because they're playing hard to get, which never works. Trust me, if we say no, it's usually because we aren't interested. And most nothing you say is gonna get us to change our minds. Trust me. Rejection sucks, but it's just a fact of life. On that merit, if you keep going at it, eventually she will give up and fall head over heels for you. I know this sounds a little headcanon-ish, but I could totally see Stan doing this, especially in season one when he was at his most stereotypical. Remember, this was the same dude who said women's emotions come from their ovaries. Stan, that is incorrect. Clearly they come from our uteruses. <laughs> Steve, I promise you. You and this comes from years of experience. Women are never right. Well, the later season sort of toned down this behavior, because maybe Steve learned his lesson, this doesn't mean this behavior totally went away. In Steve and Snot's test tubular adventure, Steve and Snot are bullied for being virgins. I was thinking, um, if the school switched to waterless urinals, they could save over 35 gallons every time these guys swirlied us. Really? People do this? And not wanting to suffer any longer, they try to get dates to the prom. As the general expectation is that on prom night, you get to pop your cherry. Prom! Prom is when girls are socially conditioned to put out the most. Yes, assuming you can get them to go with you. Yeah, that never happened to me. I just waited until after they served the buffet, and then I went home. I had school the next day. Wait, you didn't go to Seaside Heights? I thought that's what every Jersey kid did. Well, I did see the Jersey Shore house once, but I didn't have YouTube money back then, nor did I have a car. I still don't have the latter. Steve and Snot go around trying to ask out girls, and they all refuse. Use them. And I kind of like the little detail that they included girls that Steve went after in previous episodes, like all of his terrible behavior caught up to him or something. Sorry, not interested. I don't think so. In your dreams, nerd. What about? No, don't you understand? Out of options, Steve remembers, oh yeah, his father works for the CIA, and they could just clone some girls, and then take them to the prom and bang them. We use the cloning machine at my dad's work to make prom dates. We find two of the hottest girls around, we get their DNA, we clone them, and we bone them. Totally on board. Wait, what about after? <laughs> Who cares? Okay, how do they acquire DNA? Through FE means, spying on girls in dressing rooms. Field day. What are you two doing in here? I know it looks bad, two teenage boys in a girl's dressing room, but I can assure you we are only here to collect pubic hair. <laughs> Yeah, if a guy did that to me, I would do worse than that. Trust me, something like this has happened to me before, and I kicked him so hard. The pair take the DNA and make clones. Steve's date, the brunette played by Mae Whitman, will be named Glitter, and Snart's date, the blonde, will be named Honey, which admittedly is a cool name. I like Honey more than Glitter. I'm gonna name mine after my great-grandmother, Glitter. Naming your clone after your great-grandmother. That's a nice way to honor her. 
I thought your grandmother was Mama, or Betsy, or if we're talking about blood, Cassandra. But I don't put it past any of them to have Glitter as a nickname. Especially Mama. She seems like she got up to some crazy stuff. The pair try to make the clones, but find that, unlike the movies, the clones start off as babies. Ah! Unclone! Unclone! Control Z! Control Z! They're disappointed they can't just start over, until it turns out that the clones rapidly age with the estimate that they will be fully grown by the time prom rolls around. So they essentially start to raise them for the sole purpose of banging. I'm so excited for prom tomorrow. Wait, we made you something to wear to prom. Aww, thanks, Doodlebug. Um, okay, Weir doesn't even begin to describe this. Steve, Schmooley, I think Judge Turpin will want to have a word with you when this is all over. However, when prom night comes, Steve realizes, OMG, maybe we shouldn't bone the girls we raised. I don't know if I can go through with this. I mean, I raised Glitter. She's practically my daughter. I know. I feel the same way about Honey. Um, duh. But Snot takes it to mean they should bone each other's daughters. Snot, we said we weren't going to sleep with our daughters! You didn't say I couldn't plow yours! But it was heavily implied! That's worse! Or just as bad. I mean, you're basically their uncles. Either way, it's gross! Steve goes to stop them from making a huge mistake. This is what my whole life's been leading up to. And it's all my fault. Glitter, you're not just some conquest. You're an amazing and beautiful young woman. And that's how you should be treated. But stuff happens and Glitter dies. From... I've reached the age of the girl I was cloned from and my body's shutting down. Clonal cellular deterioration? Maybe. Yeah, from that. You might be thinking this is a weird detour, but Stan did something similar around the same time. And no, I'm not talking about Steve Arena. During virtual insanity, the family called Stan out for not spending enough time with his son. Hi. I haven't been there for anything in Steve's life. Yes, Stan, you neglected your son. Everyone neglects things. I've neglected these puppies. And as Steve doesn't want to do anything with him, rather than just having a talk or trying to be there for him or buying an Xbox, he decides to use a CIA avatar named Phyllis as a proxy buddy without telling Francine. Wow, I, I, I don't believe it. This is too good to be real. Of course this is real. And, and this, this is, is really, really happening. happening. Because, because this, this is, is real. Real. Really, 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 really real. Really, really real. At first, Steve enjoys spending time with Phyllis, not realizing she is a puppet controlled by his father. Uh, hey, you, you hungry? <laughs> <sighs> oh, there was a paper doily under that, but I'm sure you'll figure that out later. However, Phyllis doesn't want to get physical, so in the process, he quickly gets the attention of another girl named Chelsea, who kind of looks like me, but with orange hair and freckles. And also kind of sounds like me when I'm around strangers, like, can, can I please have a pizza, please? Oh, that sounds like fun, Steve. I'm free whatever night that is. Oh, great. You can have these, because I don't want to go. It's too bad she has no soul, but she is voiced by Allison Hannigan, so I guess that's a plus. Oh, and Phyllis is voiced by Sarah Michelle Geller, but getting off topic. Now, any good father would want Steve to be with Chelsea. Honestly, she's probably the most compatible out of all of his, like, potential girlfriends. Since continuity is sort of a thing with this show, I would love for her to come back one day. And unlike most girls, she did like Steve before he tried to make a Move on her. There's a lot about me you don't know. And hey, Stan now has the power to help Steve in a fatherly type way. Be his wingman, give him tips. But Stan doesn't want to lose Steve, and all he sees in Chelsea is a loser, baby, a loser, goddamn baby. She's like Squidward. She is still a loser, even with the triple negative. Therefore, as Phyllis, he cut Steve a deal. Uh if you go to the dance with me, I'll have some hands with you. Okay! Wait, what? Okay, I need a moment to absorb this. This is almost just like that. Except I will be locked in eye contact with my son while he plows my cyber soil. <sighs> 
understand. This means you'll be boil brooking your own son. Ew. And yes, I meant to type in boning, but I wrote the majority of the script on the plane down to Orlando. And we hit turbulence, so spell change. And I think one of those kids on the flight got me sick. And even if everybody tells him not to do it, especially Bullock of all people, who was kind of doing something similar as a baby, Stan is adamant to go through with it. This way I get to keep hanging out with him. Plus I get to be there for his biggest milestone ever, losing his virginity. To you, you idiot! Wow, Stan, Father Roy did a number on you. Wait, Kitty, I thought Stan said he came on to Father Roy, not the other way around. Really, Gavrin? I always thought it was a joke on how SA victims feel like they brought it onto themselves, or it's their fault, which it isn't. And as we know from the later seasons, whenever something embarrassing or traumatic happens, Stan does mental gymnastics to come out on top. I could totally see him getting abused by Father Roy. Roy, but saying in his mind he did it, so he's the top dog. Kitty, you know, I kind of like this psychological case study, but I think we're getting off topic and people don't like that. Sorry, look, I'm actually trying here. Francine is able to talk Stan out of statutory incest raping his own son, because that's basically what he's doing. Wait, right? Regardless, this is worse than Bojack, if that's even possible. But it is a little funny. I must get it plowed. Son. Sorry, I laughed more than I should have with this line. I said it before and I'll say it again, I'm the type of person that laughs at how a joke is said, rather than the joke itself. While Phyllis tells Steve to go be with Chelsea, well, it's too late. Ah, uh, turns out Chelsea didn't like that I went to the dance with Phyllis. She's got way more pride than her physical appearance would suggest. <laughs> you know what? Good for her. However, the idea of Phyllis raises a good point. What if Stan took a more active role in helping Steve, especially finding a girlfriend? Well, they almost always turn out badly. You know, Steve Arino could cover this entire section, but I have a theme to stick to. During Toy Hori, oh my god, I just got that title. I'm so stupid. Stan tries the Butters method by having Steve lose his virginity to an escort, thinking it'll stop him from playing with toys, even if... I hate to break it to you, Stan, y'all. Adults, including men, frequently play with toys all the time. Or they just call them fancy, kid-approved names like wand massagers or Funko Pops. And as they can't go to Nevada, as Steve is still a minor, Stan decides to take him to Mexico. Son, I am bringing you to Mexico to show you that you don't need toys anymore. And by the way, Father of the year here. Mexico! And in the process, they get arrested and thrown in jail and forced to learn about the origins of horchata. You know, I've never had it. I just, I've always wanted to try it, but wherever I go, it's never on the menu. Is it true it's barf? Because this could very much influence me more than you would expect. Or infamously, during A Smith in the Hand, Steve has to learn about X's and O's. Yeah, I'm using that term from now on. <laughs> What was that for? He's only 14. I don't want some unionized pervert teaching my son about nature's filthy secret. As this was 2005, Stan refuses to allow Steve to do so and forces Principal Lewis, back before he was crazy, to implement a one-person class for Steve. Then instead of your bohemian filth fest, I demand he be offered a more wholesome, family-friendly alternative. And who do you propose teach this stupid class? I'm Professor Smith. Oh my god, poor kid. Like, his father is so uptight that he makes the Amish look like Green Party candidates. I'm not even joking. Oh, this be the morally upright class? I'm in the other one. Excuse me, English. Of course, as a 14-year-old boy, Steve knows what X's and O's are. But he has a question. If you can't get any tail, is it okay to just feel the sensation all by yourself? Some of the guys at school say if you have urges, you can handle them yourself. <sighs> I knew this day would come. Well, so long as you aren't breaking any laws or doing it in front of people, or having it take over your life, you're probably fine. It has no negative health effects, it can help you sleep, and it relieves stress. But Stan says, no, don't enjoy the serotonin. It forces your palms to grow hair, and your eyeballs will fall out, and your feet will smell like trout. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, but what if you 
use like a toothbrush or a cucumber or a sock? Will hair grow on the implements or will you only go blind? After watching the same video Stan had to as a child, which turned him insane, Steve becomes as repressed as his father, if that's even possible. There you are. Uh, of, of, of course I'm here. Where, where would I be? Alone? Touching myself? Yeah, right. Only perverts and Democrats do that. <laughs> well said, soldier. Well, Stan, meanwhile, learns the wonders of touching yourself under the guise of using lotion to cure a burn. Please, just a dab will do me. Yes, yes! <laughs> he rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. It does this whenever it's stilled. At least until... Mom and Dad's bedroom, Mom and Dad... Ah! Ooh! Ah! Ooh! Ah! Yep, Steve is gonna go blind. Rather than apologize or admit he was wrong, Stan decides to force his ideology on all of Langley Falls using public access television. Dan, can I offer an observation? I think you might be imposing your personal hang-ups on the public and that's a violation of the First Amendment. <laughs> Obligatory Florida joke. Stan, are you the one behind YouTube? Are you the reason I got that strike? Francine is able to talk some sense into Stan and tell him to give Steve a real talk. When a man and a woman are in love or very drunk, they or the man can balance on his elbows and push off with his feet. Which is why you should always have a towel handy to- Were you taking notes? No, uh, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a monk and I'm Mama Kitty. Why would I have time for such- Bill. Francine, no! Because if you don't explore them, you'll repress them. Then one day, when you do discover them, you'll reject your wife, hurt your son, and try to take down TV! Actually, maybe this is a good jumping off point. Stan is the worst person to teach Steve about X's and O's or to help him nab a girl. He's repressed in the worst way, which even the episode acknowledges. To him, doing it is just quick and easy missionary, and any deviation is evil, be it spanking or jelly or or doing it when you're ovulating. And Stan can just be like a healthy person and gradually go outside of his comfort zone. When Stan discovers the wonders of kinks and that they are perfectly natural, he effectively turned his bedroom into a dungeon that Quagmire would call a little much. Not saying Francine is right either, especially in that one episode. But maybe set of Stan was right. They both kind of balance Steve out. Which takes us to the episode My Purity Ball and Chain, which was this entire video. I just needed to wrap it up with a bunch of exposition. Like chocolate covered truffles. Are those any good? Francine is cleaning around one day when she discovers some stuff in Stan's stash. Not my journal? How dare you? Those are my most private thoughts. Okay, I confess. Every entry was plagiarized from the diary of Anne Frank. Stan, do you have some stuff you want to talk about? Normally, I'm in favor of fanfics. I write my own from time to time. But Anne Frank was a real girl, and she had a really tragic story, and that seems a little disrespectful. Instead, Francine says that the school is going to have an assembly on abstinence. For some reason. Really, this always seemed weird to me. Isn't Principal Lewis, like, the principal? Like, Brian freaking Lewis. I feel like he would hate this. Francine disagrees, saying that they should teach the kids about how to do stuff safely, which I 100% agree with. Kids are gonna do it, or try to do it, be sure you're doing it right. Yes, if you want to be sure there's no danger, you should do abstinence, but come on, urges are natural. And don't just listen to one source. Feelings for each other are natural! We should give them the information and the space to safely explore those feelings, because they're people! See, Stan's right. Nobody has all the answers, and one person's definition might differ from yours. To prepare him for the assembly, Francine wants Stan to give his son the talk. Have you given Steve the talk? Steve doesn't need the talk. He's not ready. Francine, have you been watching this video? He must have given him the talk like 20 different times. Oh wait, you're a part of the video. My bad. Stan is too squeamish to give Steve the talk. As after all, if he screws up, they gotta go back to celibate sock puppet. And he's worse than Ubi. Hello, everyone. I'm Footsie, the celibate sock puppet. And I'm content to eat taffy, collect stamps, and look at my aquarium all day long. But he quickly changes his tune when he sees Steve getting nasty with a broom. He's playing a harmless game of Quidditch. 
from Harry Potter? I'm not fully versed on the rules of Quidditch, but I think that's worth three points. Well, I think the little thing is how you end the game. It was the explanation I got for that long-winded speech that Luce gave about not Quidditch that really just felt like Dana Terrace airing out some grievances, and felt massively out of place for how the episode was proceeding. Still, the assembly comes. Drop! Shut your legs, cover your slot! Whoa! Oh! That's how us virgins roll! I like the detail that this speech is made for girls and that the girls are the one running it. Like it's up to them to protect their purity, but at the same time, they cannot be trusted with the protection of their own purity. They can't win. Despite this, the assembly is making me bored. And when I'm bored, I do things. Things that are not very monk-like. Nah, I don't. I just gotta make jokes. Steve, of course, doesn't like the fact he gets singled out. This next sketch shows us how to stand up to someone that bullies you for choosing abstinence. I mean, if anybody should be singled out, it's not. He thought he popped a girl's cherry and all he did was pop a stress ball. The head girl from the assembly, Shannon, talks to Steve afterwards. I thought it was really brave how you stood your ground, silently crying when Mertz pantsed you. Then how you courageously called out the names of other virgins Mertz could pick on instead. The pair discover they have plenty in common, especially their love of Slade, aka Deathstroke, who I knew only is Slade because I watched the original Teen Titans. But I'm writing a play based on Deathstroke. The supervillain from DC Comics? You know he prefers to go by Deathstroke, Deathstroke the, the Terminator, Terminator, although his real name is Slade Wilson. Wilson. Oh, it's great you can write, Shannon. I mean, come on, Steve's father has to plagiarize material from a Holocaust victim. Shannon also takes the opportunity to invite Steve to her purity group. Uh, a group of us pledge to abstain from any activity until marriage. Purposefully? Yeah! With time running out, Francine insists that Stan must have the talk with Steve. And she wonders, why do you keep delaying it? Stan, this is the eighth broom we've gone through this month. You have to have the talk with Steve. I know. Um, then why don't you do it, Franny? As it turns out, Stan is scared to give him the talk because of his previous experience with it. When he was a boy, like probably way younger than Steve, his father showed him what happened. Here's a little number I call the Chattanooga Wheelbarrow. Might want to put on your poncho, son. You're in the splash zone. Knockout? No! Wait, you're a top? I always thought knockout would be like a power bottom. He and Fizzy give me those vibes. Speaking of, this kind of reminds me of that King of the Hill episode where Hank learned about coupling through watching cows, and then he tried to impart the same lesson onto Bobby, only to realize stuff has changed was messed up for years. I hate to break it to you, baby, but you still are. Stan is ready to give Steve the talk, but then he finds the abstinence pamphlet. But you're at an age where we have to talk about... abstinence? Are you not interested? Rats, we gotta delay the conflict further and further. At the rec center, which is where they're hosting the purity group, we find out that Steve is the sole churro in a room full of tacos. His father doesn't count. And they both learn about the purity group. Remember how Sal Park had the ring where, thanks to the Jonas Brothers, Kenny was convinced by his girlfriend to wear one as a symbol of his commitment to be pure until marriage? Well, while I love that episode, I wish they did an episode on the actual concept of purity rings because they can be really creepy or have creepy implications. And until they marry a man we choose, they pledge themselves to us. So it's kind of like you're dating your own daughter? Only way to ensure they grow up normal. Oh, thank goodness. My father is somewhere that's green, and my fingers are like sausages. No ring for this, kitty. I am allowed to continue the disgusting lifestyle to which I've grown accustomed. We have study group with our dads, movie night with our dads. Sometimes we skip the movies and just go to the woods to kind of hang out. Ew! Do you share a bed with your father? Does your mom mind? At least Queen Victoria, prior to being queen, got her own bed. Steve doesn't like this, but Stan essentially forces him to agree. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Oh, please say yes, Steve. If you join, we can hang out all the time. I mean, you two could probably hang out together outside of the group, but then we would have no conflict. So purity pledge it. Purity pledge. Purity pledge. Steve tells his friends about the purity pledge. Go easy, Mertz. No, Steve, we're cool. I have too much respect for the pledge. You do? I'd kill to have that kind of self-control. 
but I'm a slave to my carnal appetite. I want an episode on Mirth so badly. Sam continues to get acquainted with the other fathers and learns that as a purity pledge papa, he gets cool stuff like swords. Shut up. They represent our role as knights of purity. Good thing he's part of the CIA, and so could probably get stuff like this on the regular. Of course, Francine doesn't approve, but her only real role in this episode is to be the voice of reason, so she shall not intervene. Shannon and Steve spend extra time together, with the hormones starting, much to their father's displeasures. I, you probably don't want to read it. <laughs> you were just being nice. No, I'd love to. You really don't have to. I honestly would love to read it. How Dare they be happy. At the community center, they're gearing up for the purity ball, which... There's dinner and speeches, and it all ends in a beautiful dance with their dads, which symbolizes their commitment. Once again, totally glad my father went away to get a pack of smokes, or maybe some milk. I wasn't born, so I don't remember. Steve falls putting up a banner and ends up alone with Shannon. Kind of. Shannon has a secret. Can I confess something? I wish you were my dad. What? You know, so I could date you. Ew, but oh, what if you hold somebody's hand? What the hell is this? Holding hands? You strumpets! You've had way too much freedom lately. I'm moving you back into my bedroom! Oh, I guess that answers that question. You know about the bedroom? That's still gross. Shannon's dad wants Steve out, but Stan wants him to stay, because then he doesn't have to give the talk. There must be something we can do to stay! There is... One thing you can do. It's aversion therapy camp! You can't just chemically castrate him. Just saying, this is something Stan would totally do. Afterwards, he looks like this. My boy, you, uh, you look tired. Camp must have been fun. Steve, pure. Oh, he's pure. I mean, oh, he's pure. Purely traumatized. At the purity ball, stuff happens. The beginnings of these dances are always so awkward. Girls on one side of the room, dads on the other. Everyone's all nervous. My trick? Picture them in their underwear. Ew. One dance later, and Stan realizes that he messed up Steve so badly that he's forever stunted. Probably worse than Stan. And will never be normal again. Hey, bud. May I have this dance? Okay. Oh. Coming on a little strong, son. I won't feel sick if I don't look at them. You can't even look at girls? Poor kid. All he had to do was take the broom into the basement. No, oh, I was the one with the problem. I was so worried I might screw you up that I got you involved in this craziness and it screwed you up even worse. Is that what I think it is? A self-fulfilling prophecy in a nutshell. Finally, Sian gathers up the courage to say, Shannon, your dad's a creep. Yeah. Thank you. Furthermore, Don't you see? The more we shelter them, the harder it'll be for them to make good decisions on their own. It's true. Stan throws the kids into the closet, letting whatever happens, happens. Love conquers all, and Steve, instead of seeing whoever that is, sees a broom. Wait, so did Steve lose his virginity? Like, that's my biggest problem with this episode. That's my biggest problem. The episode acts like he did it, but every episode after this, Steve is right back to square one. Which just felt weird. Like, seriously? Like, Stan broom in the closet to let whatever happens happens while having a huge talk about it. So wouldn't the implication be that Steve was doing it? They couldn't just say something like Steve was so excited he couldn't get his pants off in time, or they just kissed or they held hands, like maybe the purity group stunted Shannon too so she has no idea what that is. But anyway, wow, Stan and Steve, and I thought Peter ruined his own son. A frequent question the fan base wonders is why can't Steve finally lose his virginity? virginity and be a dead girl walking. Well, while I think part of it is bad luck, I think another reason is he tries too hard to be like his father, just without any of the looks or charm that his father also possesses, which equates to a creepy, nerdy, geeky boy. And his role model isn't much better. He's repressed to kingdom come and his will will not be done. Oh well, at least Steve can't impregnate a robot like Morty did. Oh my god, that would be such a good episode. Oh well, um, bye. Have you been spending time with my dad? No. Is that why he's gone all the time? Because you could do better. A lot better. See ya. You, Steve.